We don't need to sell the idea of a quality beverage to most people involved in making contempt. Other than Jack Palance, they're European, so they're experts at knowing about good wine and good beer and also good coffee. Well, maybe that last one should be aimed at South Americans. Anyway, we're about to talk about a product that's only sold in America and Canada, so French folks can just go ahead and keep their coffee. Is that made from the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica beans you'll find in Canada? No, of course not. It's simple facts. Their coffee's French. We're going to promote something that's North American. Anyway, Spark Plug Coffee sports those dynamic beans, and they deliver them to customers in the U.S. and Canada within a week. Those of us who live in Canada don't even have to pony up any money for shipping. And that goes for regular caffeine-laced beans or the kind that are half-calf or decaf. Sparkplug has many blends and roasts. Seasonal blends are even an option, which will be handy soon because we're not that far from spring, so you can stop drinking a winter brew. And what do you think about taking on a membership in the Autopilot Coffee Club? That will get you perks and deals, plus you'll save money on every order. You can even customize to get your orders only when you need a new batch, not just whenever they send it to you and expect you to pay up. No, madame et monsieur, this is not a hokey coffee of the month club. Get your fingers loose and then type sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S into your phone, your computer, your whatever. You'll save 20% off your next order, and that goes for regular customers who've never taken advantage of our promo code before, or if you're brand new to any of this. Use that H-Y-E-S promo code and you'll save l'argent. All right, the time has come to put on our film reviewing caps. Where's mine? I always misplaced that thing. Ah, forget it. My head is fine without a cap on it. Let's go, Bev. And action! Have you ever seen... Contempt. Bonjour, mes amis, and merci for écouting the 572nd podcast on this channel. We yabber on about classic motion pictures, and we spoil them. I'm the writer who walks around his place wrapped in a bedsheet like it's a toga, rather than strolling around naked or actually putting on clothes, Ryan Ellis. And here's the beautiful, busty blonde who doesn't have a melodramatic music score playing when she's mad at me, my wife, Bev. <laughs> That's me. You're my wife, Bev. And we hear a plane up there right now, and it's right basically at lunchtime, so it might be a noisy recording. But we're doing this on our vacation, and Bev is home for once in the afternoon. This is the final entry in Love in a Word Month. We talked about six romantic titles of one type or another that all had one-word titles in February. So the coming attraction's opinion question for our sixth and final show this month is... One of the reasons we're covering Contempt is because it's on Sight & Sound's 2022 list of greatest films of all time. In fact, it's been highly ranked on all four Sight & Sound lists since... Sight and sound lists since 1992. <laughs> Beyond that, we were overdue to talk about Jean-Luc Godard. He's a renowned French filmmaker, as was his buddy Truffaut. So were Renoir, René, Varda, Romer, Tati, and Ackerman, who was from Belgium but made French films. I could rattle off a lot more big names than that, but it's a good sampling, so here's my question. Which French filmmaker is your favorite? Maybe one of those, maybe somebody else I didn't mention. I've thought about it, and I don't have a favorite French filmmaker. Generally speaking, French cinema, it's really beautiful. It's super important as a student of cinema. I care a lot about the French New Wave and all the great art that was made in France. Which was happening in this time frame. It was happening in this time frame and is responsible for Hollywood in the 70s. It's great and it's important. Easy Rider is really influenced by that. Dennis Hopper was oh, a big, big fan time. of these guys. Or Bonnie and Clyde, another one. Yes. But it's just not my jam. The only French film I can think of, especially from the New Wave, that I really love is 400 Blows. Okay. But I can't even say that I'm a Truffaut fan. The only other Truffaut film I've even seen is Jules and Jim. Am I allowed to say Denis Villeneuve? <laughs> I, I know did, I'm not. You can say anybody you want to this Well, French. Denis Villeneuve is not French. French-Canadian. He's, he's Canadian, but he is very French. Okay. <laughs> In the French-Canadian. Québécois. He's, he's Québécois. You could say Jean-Pierre Jeunet Yeah, that's as a well. totally different culture. You can't really compare them. And I just said you could have said Jean-Pierre Jeunet as well. He did, I think, Amelie, didn't he? He's done some films. Yeah, but he's not. I, I thought of him too. We recently watched The Gleaners and I because it was on the most recent Sight and Sound list. And I love that movie, but am I an Agnes Varda super fan? No. I loved mm. Gene Dealman, but I hated the other Chantal Ackerman film News that we've home. watched together. I'm a true foe guy. I love Day for Night, and I certainly enjoy and respect The 400 Blows, Jules and Jim, and even Fahrenheit 451. Although overall, I prefer Italian, Japanese, and Swedish directors to even the great French names I just rattled off. So. Italian, you're talking about... Fellini, Fellini, Rossellini. Kurosawa, Ozu, the more modern era, Hayao Miyazaki, I think I said that right. And Swedish, obviously, Bergman. So these guys are the people I think I connect with more than French filmmakers. But that was the point of this, was to set up the French New Wave. So, Hot Lady Mad was released in France at the end of 1963. Then it came over to America about a year later at the end of 1964. 
So do the quick math, and you'll see that it's 60 years old this year. Anyway, by Godard standards, this was a big-budget film, and at least it didn't lose money, even if it didn't exactly rake it in. He wanted to make at least one big-budget film, and I guess he hated the experience of it, even though this film is so revered. We're about to talk about that in a second. But first, this movie about movies is 10 years older than me. I'm now 50. So please, Bev, remind all of us what it's about by giving us the skinny on Le Mépris. In order to secure a screenwriting job adapting the Odyssey with the legendary Fritz Lang, Paul Javal allows his vulgar American producer Jeremy to spend time with his beautiful wife Camille, whether or not she wants to. When Camille catches on to the arrangement, their marriage is irreparably damaged. Paul tries to deny what's happening, he rationalizes, he argues, he manipulates, but Camille's love is replaced by a sad resignation and he cannot win her back. She leaves with Jeremy, and the two immediately die. Not sure what becomes of the film they were trying to make. <laughs> well, they keep filming at the end of this movie. They're still making that one. But he says something about how, oh, he's going to give up on cinema after this. He's We'll see. Yeah, obviously he's drawn to it in the first place. But I guess he doesn't have a hot wife to secure him those mint jobs. Yeah. Well, on that note, in a nutshell, they used to say it in wrestling all the time, pimping ain't easy. <laughs> Or was that Why would wrestling talk about pimping? There was a character that played a pimp. Okay. And that was this thing. Pimp it ain't easy. He was a big time fan favorite. And also you could just say pimp my wife. What's that? Pimp my ride was a show they had a long time ago. Maybe they still do. I don't know. But pimp my wife. That's what he's doing here. Although we never see any evidence that anything untoward happened in the earlier stages of the movie. Later on, she's kissing Jeremy, but it's also for Paul's benefit, seemingly. It but is. But then she does go off with him too. So we will talk about our motivations in a second. Let's set up the impressive numbers on this. Rod Tomatoes. 92% of critics like this film. 8.6 out of 10 is the average. There are 65 reviews on the site, so pretty good sampling. And 85% of audiences. Breathless is Godard's best-reviewed movie. I think it was his first ever movie also, as was The 400 Blows for Truffaut. Same year, I think, or around the same time, maybe a year apart. But Godard has a lot of 90% plus fresh ratings. I say that right? He's a lot of ratings that are over 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Sight and Sound. So the numbers in the last four times, the last four cycles, it was tied for 54th two years ago, almost said last year, 2022. It was tied for 21st in 2012. It was 23rd in 2002, so very highly ranked those two times, and 36th in 1992. So it has a bit of a seesaw thing going on there. It's up and down a little bit, but 54 is still pretty impressive, and it's still so well regarded by the sight and sound people. We're covering this because it is Godard. It's well reviewed by these people. It is also Brigitte Bardot, our first time covering her. And all the sight and sound people, the critics, everybody loves it so much, but what about you? <laughs> I do think it's a great film. It really stayed in my mind the week since we watched it. I think it might now be my mental shorthand for a certain kind of heartbreak, but I hated the experience of watching it. Paul is a bastard. He deserves all his agony and worse. Camille is so frustrating for taking passive aggression to this new level. Their long fight sequence in the middle of the film is incredible and it drove me crazy they have mm -hmm. this two minute argument that repeats for like 20 minutes 30, 30 minutes oh my god you said when we were watching it and i was getting so frustrated you were like but isn't this how couples argue and you're totally right that is how couples argue so there's an accuracy a verisimilitude about it but after that the film really lost me on a narrative level but it's so interesting that there's still so much to get out of it. One of the movies that we've covered, this is true, but a lot of movies we've covered where I didn't necessarily enjoy watching it, but the experience of reading about it and talking about it is so delightful. So retroactively, you didn't like it, but you liked it. Because you know, I thought you were going to say you hated it. You didn't love it when the movie ended. We watched it about a week ago, so details may be foggy at this point. And I've seen this twice, but the other time was a long time ago. So it's what another, do you think? But it's another movie, though, that I've seen before that it might as well have been the first time because that was so long ago when I did see it. And it didn't really get into my soul because I don't really love Godard that much. I respect his movies. Breathless, of course, is one of those. And I've seen a lot of them. The Sight and Sound is obsessed with this guy. There's so many of his movies on this past Sight and Sound list and other ones as well that didn't make that one. But as for the quality of the film itself, I liked it more than you, for sure. I really did appreciate that long fight scene. I got a lot out of that. And I'll be a guy here and say, looking at Brigitte Bardot for an hour and 43 <laughs> minutes, often nude, although you don't see anything that's actually truly nudity. It's just her bum, although I'm a little bit surprised they showed that in American cinemas. But she is fully naked more than once in this movie. Was it three times I think we see her with nothing on? That helps. I mean, you don't even need to see her naked to be dazzled by her. She oh, true. So Clothes on, she'd be great. Even beautiful. with that black wig, she looks great. Oh, my God. She is so beautiful. I'm a straight woman, and I am dazzled to look upon her. It is a pleasure of the film yeah. to see such a beautiful movie star. And it's a well-shot movie as well. Mm -hmm. It looks great. He really takes advantage of the Italian locations. There are four languages in this movie. French, of course. English with... 
Palance's character, people sometimes call him Palance, whatever, German, and of course Italian. I guess German would be Fritz Lang, and the Italian is, a lot of the characters, actually Italian, well, they are in Italy, is a big part of this film. It's not really a French movie as far as where it's set. Obviously, it's set in Italy, I think entirely, right? And the opening credits are spoken. We don't see anything on screen. I don't, maybe we see Contempt or Le Mepris, but we don't see the directed by credit, the actors. It's okay. maybe Godard, but somebody's speaking it while they're shooting Francesca walking down the street. Yeah. And that's the first time that we get meta because she's not in this movie that they're making, this Odyssey movie that Fritz Lang is directing. But we also see towards the end, before things really blow up at the end, well, I guess she leaves is what really blows it up and then dies in that car accident. But they show Paul and Camille sitting in the boat and they're filming them, meaning Fritz Lang's team is filming them. It's not just Godard literally is filming this movie, but it's the meta thing. I like that part of the movie too. I like movies about movies and seeing the filmmaking process. But why are they in the movie too? That's a strange touch. I didn't really get that. It's a very Godard touch. One of his hallmark things was that he loved to frequently remind the audience that they are watching a piece of art. A story that's being told by a person with their perspective. He never wanted the audience to truly get lost in a film. And maybe this is part of why you and I both struggle with Godard. He keeps us at arm's length always. His films are very interesting. There's this great frantic energy in them yeah. always. But I find them really cold and distant. I've never been pulled into the story of a Godard film. We watched Puro, Puro, I don't know how you say that name, but Puro, Le Fou. Puro Le Fou, yeah. Is that how you say it? It means Crazy Pete is the English translation. Okay. And we watched that right after that list came out in 2022 because I had not heard of that one either. I liked that one. I don't remember it all that well, but I liked it for sure. And Vivre Sa Vie, I believe, is him. And Weekend and many, many others. He's got so many movies they I love. Think... Well, that Histoire du Cinema movie, which isn't a movie, it's a TV show, but it made the list. I don't get why that made the list. It's not a movie. I kind of like that they're loosey-goosey about their definition of what a movie is. But the actress who plays the lead in Pierre Le Fou, her name is Anna Karina. Oh, yeah. She Anna. was married to Godard. That's right, too. And the presumption is that... Brigitte Bardot is He's kind of a her? stand-in okay. for her because their marriage was contentious. They got married when they were pretty young. She was like 19. He was never there. He was always doing his own thing. He was not a great husband. And their marriage was starting to fall apart. They got divorced two years after this film came out. So the presumption is that is what he was writing. I have a theory for why I think this movie scores so high on Sight and Sound, and I think you'll probably agree. There's three things about it that the Sight and Sound critics just adore. And one is that it's Godard. They love Godard. They do. How many Godard films have been on the list I didn't on count, and off over the years? Maybe a dozen. It's crazy. There's very few filmmakers that are that represented. Maybe Hitchcock. I, I don't, can't no, think. I don't think not even. Is. No, I don't think so. There you go. They love French films in general, also and Godard true. is just their favorite. And in fairness, his influence is legendary. Respect is due. The second thing is it's a movie about making movies. Yeah. Self-reflective films play great with this crowd. They love movies about movies. Three, it has a cartoonishly ugly depiction of a Hollywood money man. <laughs> <laughs> How many people watching this film get a perverse thrill out of the way Jack Palance is this cartoonishly evil Hollywood money guy? He doesn't speak the language. He's crass. He's vulgar. He's trying to sleep with all the women. He doesn't care about art at all. And they're all just trying to do their best while this guy is ruining their picture. He's giddy when we see that siren. What's her name again? only about eight people credited in the whole movie. Linda Veras, V-E-R-A-S. She's the siren who's swimming in those rushes. He doesn't like these rushes. He's mad. And that's, of course, why they're bringing the writer, too, to rewrite some things. We see a lot of statue shots in those rushes. But when he sees her, he goes from being annoyed or disinterested to, oh, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? It's almost like Harvey, probably. He's like a kid. Apparently, they butted heads because Jack Palance was frustrated how Godard just kept telling him to make it bigger, be louder, be He cast the wrong guy. Jack Palance wasn't subtle, but he wasn't a big actor either. Mm, he was somewhere between it. those two things. Look at him in Shane. Ten years before this came out in France. That was 53. And this came out in 63 in France. And he got nominated for an Oscar for that. He later won it, of course, for City Slickers, both times supporting actor. I think he was Which nominated. a pretty big performance, as I recall. Curly in City Slickers? I think big, but also not yelly, screamy like Nicholson would do, for example. I think it was showy, but quietly showy. Maybe that's what it is. His voice doesn't really ever raise that much and this maybe it's a little bit more and it's not really the best role for him possibly but he also is going after this guy's wife right in front of this guy we don't know what happened but she's very unhappy for most of this movie the opening scene of course it helps that she's naked chest down in the bed 
And she's asking Paul, and this is before anything's happened in the movie with the whole Jeremy thing, what he thinks of her body, one part at a time. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I don't know, they're all 15 out of 10. I don't think there's anything on you that isn't perfect, although every woman thinks she's imperfect. Even the perfect ones think they don't look very good. But it's one shot, and I think the camera's moving as well. There's quite a few wonders in this. Kadar like to do that kind of stuff. And the lighting does change. It went from a red filter to a white one to a blue one. And I'm guessing that's a reference to the French flag. Maybe the, is the Italian oh, flag. Catch, no, the yeah. Italian flag is green, isn't it? Somewhere is green in there. I think so. Yeah. Anyway, the French flag is red, white, blue, and I assume that was a deliberate touch. And this is where she's not unhappy per se, but still, look what she is doing. What do you think of these things? The guy seems to love his wife. It's hard to really know for sure, but you're going to wonder if you don't look good enough. <laughs> okay, I have things. First of all, that was shot after the fact when right. big budget films. The was... real life Jeremy. The real life Jeremy was mad that they're like, how could you cast Brigitte Bardot and not have more nude scenes with her? So he shot that and then put it at the beginning of the film to be like, there you go. Focus on her body really carefully. But of course, I'm sure that was lost on half the people watching who were just dazzled by her. (laughs) So that wasn't a scene that Godard really wanted to put in the film. And it was like an F you to them. That would have been the way he did a worse thing to have to do if she wasn't naked at least three others or two other times for sure in the movie. I'm not really bothered by the presence of her nudity in the film at all. It's definitely titillating. It's definitely there to get butts and seats. There are definitely people who saw this film only because they heard that you get to see Brigitte Bardot almost nude. Look at the poster. Exactly. I'm sure that's true, and I'm sure there were probably some people who saw the film for that reason and discovered that they were enchanted by the originality of this film, the guts and daring of this film. And maybe it was the trick that got them in the theater to get them into the French New Wave. This is a film about a marriage that's falling apart, and she's asking him for reassurance that he loves her, but she's just listing all of her appearance. Do you love my feet? Do you love my knees? Do you love my bottom? Do you love my breasts? Do you love my face? And he says, yes, 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 of course. And then she says, well, you must love me completely. But she's just listing the way she looks. Does Paul love her. He loves being married to a beautiful woman. He loves looking at her. He loves the way it makes him look to be married to someone like her. But he doesn't act with love. What he does to her is not loving at all. There's no respect there. And then when she calls him out on it, he lies to her, gaslights her. He's not a good husband at all. And Mm. I don't get the impression that his love is all that sincere. So it's opening with a scene that's like, well, this is how he loves her. And this is how she's used to being loved. So this scene's actually pretty important. not enough. Considering Godard didn't want it. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but this is how I interpret this bit of writing. Of course, in a film about marriage, I'm always going to relate more to the woman. You're always going to relate more to the man when you have a film about a marriage between a man and a woman. Her heartbreak, the way that it's portrayed in this film, and the moment, because it happens really early in the movie, the moment she realizes what's happening, that he has made an arrangement with the producer for her to be left alone with him, for the producer to get a chance with her in order for him to get this job. He'll supposedly take a cab to Jeremy's villa, but then he's 30 minutes later than he's supposed to be, and from that point on, she's always angry. We don't know what happened. Jeremy maybe did take things too far, but maybe she is just bothered enough that even if Jeremy did nothing wrong... It's not about Jeremy's is, behavior. She's yeah. not mad about Jeremy's behavior. Jeremy is Jeremy. He's going to be a jerk. That's his whole thing. But why would you leave a woman who you love alone with a man like him? Now, when we first meet Jeremy, he's in the screening room. He's laughing at the sirens, the rushes. He's yelling about the rushes that he doesn't get that aren't what he likes. And then some poor assistant walks in and he slams the film reels all over the room and makes a big mess and stomps around and yells. And he's clearly an irrational, childish, hot-headed jerk. And he says to Paul... Why did I hire you? Because I heard you have a beautiful wife. So Paul takes the check from him. He agrees to work with this man who has no artistic vision, who's giving Fritz Lang, this legend, a hard time, Mm -hmm. who's admitted the only reason he's hiring him is because he wants to get a shot at his wife. And he takes the check and he folds it and he puts it in his pocket. And the very next thing he does is suggests that she gets in the car with him. And she knows exactly what's happening right away. She looks at him and he won't look at her, but he's like, no, go ahead. I'll take a cup. It's fine. And then he's 30 minutes late so she knows for sure if she had any doubt that he's pimping her out and in that moment doesn't matter what he said when they were in bed together doesn't matter how much he reassured her she understands her place in this marriage that he may love things about her but he doesn't respect her but i think from that moment on he's lost her and then the rest of the film is about her coming to terms with it him coming to terms with her coming to terms with it Mm. 
And it's going to be drawn out. I think we've all been there where you have a moment of clarity where you know your relationship is over, but that doesn't mean you walk away in that moment. I don't think it feels bad even when the movie's over as far as pimping her out. Obviously, he wouldn't be happy that they died. How could he be? Whether he loved her the way you think he should have or I think he should have or not, he had some affection for this woman yes, <laughs> one time or sure. another. And he doesn't want to see anybody get killed in a car accident, I'm sure. It's a strange touch you even asked me why that happened or why I thought that happened. I don't know. What is the point of her dying at the end? Or them dying, because he dies too. Be yeah. more, maybe it'd be called misogynistic, this film, if it was just her that died and then Jeremy just walked away and nothing was wrong with him. Or maybe Jeremy was hurt, but he did survive. She's the character that deserves to be punished, be yeah. the implication. But they're together. It's their last scene together. She doesn't seem happy. She might not think she is, but she's willingly going with this guy. And obviously the marriage is truly over. Think of her options. She's in Capri. She knows her marriage is over. She knows if she leaves with Jeremy, it'll get her a ticket home and mm -hmm. it'll get back at her husband, too. There's got to be yeah. a revenge factor there. Does she like Jeremy? I don't think so. They can't even talk to each other. They don't speak the same language. Another thing is a frequent Godard thing. Characters with language barriers. Certainly true and breathless. But what about Fritz Lang, who actually just plays himself in this? We've never covered him before. And he's in the screening room the first time we see him, watching all these rushes that Jeremy's mad about. He does say to Paul, who he's never met before, because Paul's not even really a screenwriter yet. He's just a writer of, I guess, pulp novels. Who knows if he's even capable of being a good screenwriter or a rewriter in this case. He's rewriting the screenplay. But I love that Fritz Lang says this line. I didn't know it was him that said this. Maybe it wasn't him that initially said this line. But Cinemascope is only good for snakes and funerals. Yeah. And this movie's in Cinemascope. <laughs> yeah. So it's a meta thing yet again. I don't agree at all. But then again, if you shoot a movie 185 to 1, it's going to fit everyone's TV long term. And even the Scorsese's of the world have to admit that's where most people are going to see the movie many, many, many times. You can hate the fact we don't go to the cinema enough, Marty, but that's reality for you or Nolan or whoever else. That's just the way it's going to be. And so many people only see a movie on their TV. So, yes, it'd be nice to see every movie in that ratio, not square and not super widescreen. But that line about it only being good for snakes and funerals, it's a good line. <laughs> But Fritz Lang doesn't come across as a tyrant. I don't know if he was. He directed many classics, but especially Metropolis, M, Fury, which was an American film with Spencer Tracy in the later 30s after he fled Europe, and The Big Heat, which was also an American film. And that was, I think, 10 years before this. And he directed more than that. But those four titles stand out quite a bit. And this is the first time we've ever covered him. But he's playing himself as an actor and doing a pretty solid job of it, I think. What do you think of him? I don't know if I've ever seen a Fritz Lang film. You've never seen any of those before? We were going to cover Metropolis a couple years ago, but then I've never seen it was Metropolis. so long. You didn't seem like you're all that geared about it, so I just <laughs> said no way. I don't really even know that much about it. Well, we should watch some of those. I think a few of those are on various services, like Canopy has, yeah. I think, a few of those. It's at least. obviously a blind spot for me. It's kind of embarrassing to admit. His American films, like The Big Heat, are pretty good crime films. And that's interesting, too, because Godard, at least with Breathless and some elements of this, is making a French version of an American crime film, especially Breathless. He loves Bogey, and that's who that guy's obsessed with in that movie. I think... Gadar himself was a big bogey fan, but so is, I forget his name, the lead guy in Breathless. Here it's Paul thinking he looks like Dean Martin when he's in the bath and he has his hat on. Another reference to an American actor, singer and all that with Dean Martin. Another Gadar thing. He liked to come back over and over again about how America has too much influence. French culture was being bombarded by American influence. This is more obviously a theme in Breathless, but you can't deny that it's taking place here when you have the American character who's an overbearing producer telling them what to do. But as far as the filmmaking element of this and why people liked it, I think there's two other reasons why it was so, or is so popular with people to this day, especially filmmakers. One is that people suffer. And this list, <laughs> the sight and sound list, loves suffering. Women suffering especially, but anybody suffering. And the other one is, well, I don't know if you mentioned your list of three, but movies about movies. Did you mention that? Is yeah. A movie about, okay, yeah. so there's that too. But then there's also the notion that a character in a movie doesn't have to be a filmmaker in the movie, but if they're willing to do whatever it takes to make their dream happen, then I think a lot of modern directors and probably actors and writers and cinematographers too can relate to the notion that short of murder, I'll do whatever I have to, even if I have to pimp up my wife. There are probably examples of this worldwide with filmmaking where someone said, go ahead, take my daughter, my wife, my girlfriend or my boyfriend, my whatever, and do what you want with them if it's going to get me the job. And this guy's not even desperate for a job because she said that they were fine, they were doing okay when they weren't making any money. She seemed She's, like they were pretty... Yeah, she said they were happier when they were poor. And he could keep doing that by writing these things that do sell a little bit and buy them food and... <laughs> also, it's not living. implied that he's a great artist that always wanted to make films. He is just dazzled by Hollywood. He's infatuated with the fame and the glamour of Hollywood. It's not about integrity. It's really 
about the money because he compromises his vision all the time to meet where Jeremy's at. They have this famous argument about the Odyssey, whether Odysseus went away because his wife Penelope was unfaithful. It's a unique interpretation of the Odyssey. I've mm. never read the Odyssey, but I'm fascinated with it. And there's like a whole industry of people who have different takes of the Odyssey. And if there's a novel that has a fresh take on the Odyssey, I'm always going to read it. And I've never read a version where Penelope is anything but stalwart and loyal. This is debatable, but oh brother, where art thou? She's going to marry somebody else. Okay, that's one example. And that's but a pers- she never sleeps with him. She hmm. never crosses the line. And that with doesn't him. happen in the end. They do get back together. She and or was it Clooney and Holly Hunter? So she's Penny, not Penelope, and he is Ulysses Everett McGill. But always they're calling him Everett. But don't forget about Francesca, Georgia Mall or Mole, M O L L. She's the first person we see in the movie, I think. They're doing the long tracking shot, and she's the subject. Right, so the very first person, and she looks great too. She's Italian, by the way, and she's translating for everybody, so I guess she speaks multiple languages. She didn't make many movies. Actually, most of these people didn't make movies that really stood out beyond maybe one or two others, other than Palance, of course. She was in The Quiet American in 1958. Maybe there's been many versions of The Grand Green Book. Of course, Michael King, the nominee for an Oscar for it in 2002, but she was in that way back when. I didn't see anything else that really stood on her resume, but she does a pretty good job in this. And Michel Piccoli, who does play Paul, is hitting on her at least a little bit in one of the scenes, and then... A little bit. He fully grabs her. Does he grab her? Yes, he grabs her butt. And he does it in a way that he knows Camille will see him do it. Now, that's one thing about taking notes in these movies. I may have been looking down and didn't see that. I see when he stroked her hair or her arm or something, which wasn't the end of the world, but still, why are you doing that when you're married and your wife is right there? Except what's already happened with her and Jeremy, meaning Camille and Jeremy. I guess he's thinking she's lost anyway. Or Then again, if he's going to get her, then I get to be with this person. So if you're all swingers, then that's cool, but that's not the case. (laughs) Yeah, Camille has to consent to this first, and she absolutely does not. And so does Francesca. Francesca, you never really get inside her head and see how she feels about the fact that these men just seem to be passing her around and grabbing her and doing whatever. Is she sleeping with Prokosh, with Jeremy? I don't know. In the end, when they're in that villa together in Capri, they look like a couple. So I wonder if that's Francesca and Jeremy seem like they might be together. They seem to have a, let's say, romantic familiarity. You never see them kiss or anything, but you see the way that they are with each other with this familiarity that implies to me that they are sleeping together. But we never really get into Francesca's character and what's going on in her head. We don't learn almost anything about her. This poor woman, she better be getting paid a lot, let me say. I bet she wasn't. (laughs) She's very smart. She knows all these languages. She certainly puts up with a lot from these men. She works really hard. She's very good at her job. I think the odds are pretty good, especially back then, that that was not the case. She probably wasn't paid well and probably was treated even worse than this on other movies. Getting back to the big long fight scene, a lot of long takes are used here. They both get in the bath at different times. She ends up on the couch. She's going to sleep there instead. That's how mad at him she is. And she lies nude face down in a white shag. Now, is that the surreal thing here? There's a part where there's a surreal quality, isn't there? Because I know that there's that scene. And then later on when she's almost the end of the movie, sunbathing. And there's a book on her bum. And I said to you at the time, who put that there? It's like a pin-up shot. Like almost it has like to pin- be. Yeah, yeah. Because there's no realistic way. Maybe she could have. But realistically speaking, she couldn't have put the book there. You could argue Jeremy did. She, she certainly just wouldn't. Left. There's no reason to put the book there. Like, I don't yeah. want my butt crack to get sunburned. But when Paul <laughs> walks up, nobody's standing there. So obviously just the filmmakers did before they pulled away and said, okay, action. But just surreally there in a way. That's not really surreal, I guess. But we see her nude on a white shag as well. And by this point, there's nothing sexual with these two anymore, the husband and wife, like there was in the very beginning. At least they're talking about sexuality. And she wears that black wig a few times. She still looks good even in that thing, although she looks so much better as a blonde. And she wears a great green outfit. Later on, she's wearing yellow, and that's what Francesca's wearing, I think, that same day. So they almost seem like they're twins now, in a way, because they're both wearing an unusual color, too, in yellow. Although they look wonderful, not only because they're beautiful women, but because they're being shot in this movie in Italy. The lighting there is incredible. That implies that they become these interchangeable Maybe so. people to these men. We also learned he joined the Communist Party. Seems like a strange thing. Well, I guess he could be a communist. Why not? Anybody could be a communist, but he's not making much money, so that does track. (laughs) Maybe he won't be a communist anymore. She does say during that scene, too, towards the end of it, I believe, the fight scene, that I don't love you anymore. And then later on does say the word contempt. She has contempt for him. I guess it's what le mepris means, or le mepris, M-E-P-R-I-S, with an accent on the E. Contempt. And a big thing that happens in this scene with each of them, he does it first, but they hit each other. He slaps her once, and I think that's really when things might be over with because it's not a very good fight and it's not going well. 
But maybe there's a chance for them to reconcile in some kind of way. Probably not. But after that, I don't think so anymore. Now, maybe he's done it before. Not that that makes it cooler, but it might not be that unusual for her. But I feel like Bardot plays even more surly, understandably, with him well, after that. she's surprised. She plays surprised when there he hits her. The look on her face so is maybe he never did. Maybe he never did do it She's before, been though. sassing him. Her way of fighting, it's just pure passive aggression. She says she's sleeping on the couch. She says he snores or something like that. And she won't admit that she's sleeping on the couch to punish him for yeah. what he did. And he won't admit what he did. So it's good writing because it's realistic that these two people will not even admit what they're upset about and what they're fighting about. And none of the words that come out of their mouths make any sense. But he still is frustrated enough with her that he slaps her in the face. And through a lot of the scenes, wearing that sheet like a toga. Well, I think this is supposed to be where we're meant to draw comparisons with Odysseus and Penelope. Okay. I don't know. I struggle with that because... Penelope and Odysseus reunite and they end up together. Maybe not happy exactly, but there's never at a point where Odysseus is trying to pimp out Penelope. And from what I understand about that relationship and that story, I really struggle to see how this fits in. Well, maybe Godard just did a bad job of trying to fit it in. He was still fairly new to making films, too. He and Truffaut hit the ground running with their first couple of movies, certainly their very first ones each, Breathless and 400 Blows. They were both film critics first. Right. But they both made a lot of movies in a short period of time. And this was one of the first ones he made. The first maybe four or five. Although he made a lot in this short period of time here. This man never stopped working. So I can see how the Odyssey as a story is a good jumping off point for any writer, any storyteller. And it's a great jumping off point for the director and the producer to argue. It's one of the most famous and enduring stories in humanity with a fresh interpretation for every artist who adapts it. It's beautiful, it's fantastic, it's pretty malleable. So it's a great source for these two people to have really warring visions for a film about Odysseus. But I struggle to find the connection between the story of Odysseus and the story that's going on in the film. I don't struggle to see the connection between the story of the making of this film and the story that's being portrayed in this film. Godard himself battled producers on every film he made, and this was no exception, especially because it was the biggest budget film he ever made. It's no accident that Jeremy is this uninspired, vain, vile, money man. And the conflict of the film within the film is the conflict between art and commerce. Lang could represent Godard himself trying to make art but needing commerce to get it made. Lang is too calm, though, to actually be Godard. <laughs> Maybe. At least in this portrayal, maybe he was when he made his own movies, if he was more of a tyrant. I think a lot of directors probably were. I said that on Magombo on Friday, that John Ford was known to be a tyrant, and people revere him as a filmmaker as they should, but he made John Wayne cry of all people. <laughs> Not that he made the women cry. Maybe he did that too. <laughs> hey, maybe but a John guy Wayne he liked, a big sissy. We don't know. Worked with over and over again. Six mm. foot four John Wayne made him cry. So what did he say to him to make that happen? He was a bullying prick. I get the feeling that any director back then, no matter where they're from, if they needed to be to get something to happen, they would manipulate for sure, whether it be quietly and nicely or not, or they'd yell and scream. So as much as Harvey Weinstein has been a terrible human being for all the years, long before we found out what he was really doing to women, we knew he was a bullying jerk as a producer. I don't know if he's that unusual when it comes to filmmakers or people in big business. I bet this probably happened a lot back in the day, especially men doing it. I'm sure women who did have power weren't quite like that because men tend to be the ones that get volcanic over nothing. And then they get their way. A lot of times it's because you want to keep the producer or the director happy. So that's another thing in this movie that they can probably relate to is that, yeah, he may be a dick, but I've been like that. And it worked. Mm. So there's a way of looking at this film and the way it approaches the Odyssey that is also kind of a great way to approach a Godard film. I have to give the credit to this film prof that I follow on YouTube named Josh Matthews. I highly recommend him. His channel is called Learning About Movies. He's just a great speaker. He has this way of summing things up and explaining them that I find really enlightening. And he compares Godard's style to jazz music. Jazz takes a familiar tune and riffs on it, sometimes going somewhere completely different, but always returning to the same tune. I may not like Godard. I don't particularly like jazz music either. <laughs> Maybe those things are connected, but I can see how it explains Godard's style. He's improvisational. He's gutsy. He's restless. There's something invigorating about it, even if I'm someone who likes more form and structure. And here's a film that's kind of about the Odyssey, and we keep coming back to the statues, people wearing towels as togas, these kind of references to the Odyssey without really telling the story of the Odyssey. 
in a way that I find frustrating because I keep looking for those connections. I don't know that there are any. <laughs> no, no, I know. There well, are these loose these, connections, right? Sometimes people want to get deep and they just fail to do it very well. Yeah, and sometimes he's just like, look, this is a jumping off point. I'm going to improvise. I'm going to have fun with this. Yeah. Stop thinking so much about it. I love a film that's a puzzle. I love a film that is highly structured. Most of my favorite filmmakers are famously really meticulous about planning and structuring their films with every detail having intention that is not the way that he makes films and so that's probably why i struggle with them i mentioned that he does hit her during that fight scene by the way getting back to that for a second and then i've also got here that she biffs him around a little bit so she does hit him back i forgot about that oh no i remember that doesn't make it okay like a but girl slap just bah, bah, bah. and plus he grabs her by the shoulder she's trying to get away from him so she's just fighting i'm not saying it's cool point. i'm just saying that she hits okay. him back okay but it's not a parallel she doesn't slap him out of nowhere the way he slaps her she is fighting back because he's once again getting physical with her mm. only this time she's prepared and she fights back as he's being not vile well i guess it's violent well yeah. somewhere in here and i mentioned before and you just said it again as well about Godar referencing other films especially hollywood films and crime films especially breathless did this but there's a gun in this movie and they betray Chekhov because it doesn't go off it's so frustrating he when brings a gun and i was like what was the thing what was the point? And you think at that point probably that he's going to shoot Jeremy, but doesn't do that. We never see him. I least... thought he was going to shoot Camille. Or could have been that too. I think he has two scenes with the gun very briefly, but then that's it. And maybe it's supposed to be this disappointment where you think, oh, there's going to be some big climax. And yeah, there's a violent car accident and we see the aftermath of that. It's not really all that grisly, but they're clearly supposed to be dead. There's a little bit of blood maybe, but we don't really see stunt people take some incredible hit or something like that playing Bardo and Palance. And then some awful thing. You might see that now if somebody made this movie at this point. But apart from that violence, we don't see what we expected when we see that gun come out. Maybe he was just messing with us, setting up something mm -hmm. for us to anticipate and then letting us down and that being part of the point. I agree with that. What did you think the point of the wig was? Because it isn't a bad wig, but it really does look so different on her because she's got such beautiful blonde hair and then she's got this dark black wig on that she puts on and off during the fight scene. And I think even after, doesn't she go? Yeah, she goes to the screen with the wig on. There's another thing about this movie. They go to watch a movie, one of Jeremy's films, and she's got the black wig on there. So... Wants to be somebody else? Yeah, I think her whole world has been shaken up. That's her character arc. From the very beginning of the film, this is a woman who knows her marriage is over, sees her husband in a light that has turned her brain. While everything is topsy-turvy in her mind, she's almost trying on a new identity. It's something he wouldn't want her to do because he likes her blonde hair, but she's not caring so much what he thinks anymore. So she's like, oh, I'm going to do this partially to annoy him, partially to try on a new identity and see how it suits me. I think it was also something a little more common in the 60s, a style choice that you would buy a wig and just wear a wig out as part of your outfit. One more plot point that's important to mention, too, is that he does say to her, if you say no, then we'll leave. So he's trying to rekindle, well, maybe he's not really, but he's saying it out loud that he's trying to rekindle this relationship as if to say, okay, well, this is over. I will leave this and presumably give the money back or not cash that check. But she doesn't want that to happen. That's the scene where she's sunbathing with a book on her bottom. Right. Because the damage is done. Yeah. He already ruined his marriage. And when he's saying, we could leave Capri if you want. I mean, we don't have to pay off this apartment if you want. I just wanted to take the job because I thought you would like to own this apartment. I just thought you would want the money. It's good money. But I guess you don't like money, so we can leave Capri because you, for some mysterious reason, are upset about what's happening here. What would have happened if she said, okay, let's go? Do you think he would have left Capri? Maybe not. Exactly. Probably not. Yeah. I think he was manipulating her. Like, everything he's saying is manipulative. Everything she's saying is passive-aggressive. They, mm. They're never saying what they really mean to each other. I think she's pretty good in this movie, though. Not just that she looks like a 15 out of 10, but she's, I think, pretty strong in this film. We only get to see her play one emotion effectively. Most of the movie, anyway, that one emotion. She was emotion. a huge star at the time. Well, and God Created Woman, which was remade with Rebecca de Mornay in the 80s, was directed in 56 by her husband, I think at that time, Roger Vadim, who also did... At least one of the Jane Fonda, Barbarella, I believe he directed her in that, which is a very sexual movie. I think Jane Fonda is nude in that movie. I don't recall for sure. This is another incredibly beautiful woman. Bardot is still alive. She'll be 90 in September. She got married four times, including to Vadim, and tried to kill herself six times. Oh, I did not know that. Now, I'm not sure if it happened at this point, but she did try, apparently, multiple times to kill herself. And there's nothing suggesting suicide in this movie, but maybe she's playing more to herself I don't know her that well. I've only seen, I don't think I've even seen the God Created Woman original. I know I've seen the remake, which was a pretty sexual movie. I think that probably was too, as much as they could do back then with sexuality, even in Italy. Or, well, she's French, right? So maybe French. Yeah, Vadim is French too. 
But anyway, she doesn't get to do that much in the way of different stuff in this movie. There's not a lot of range she gets to show, but I do think she's pretty strong just when it comes to the performance itself. What about you? Yeah, I agree. Godard doesn't care so much about getting a really authentic and incredible performance out of his actors. Fritz Lang isn't doing much here. We already said Jack Palance is so bad that it's almost intentional. I see a parallel in the way David Lynch casts his films and directs his actors. He has gotten some of the most incredible performances out of actors, I think, of Naomi Watts. In Mulholland Drive is one of the greatest performances of the century so far. Yeah. She's just so amazing. But she's not good in the Twin Peaks reboot. She's terrible in the Twin Peaks reboot. But you know you have this incredible actress, you have this incredible director, and you see this terrible performance. So you have to go, well, this must be intentional. And yeah. I think I see that with Godard, too. And that's part of the philosophy of his style of art that he loves. He's always referencing Bertolt Brecht. Bertolt Brecht was this playwright. And he pioneered this style of storytelling that was aggressively against artifice. And he would never cast even actors. He just wanted to cast people who looked the most like he wanted them to look. He didn't want their performance to be good. So it's hard to judge her performance in this context. The same way it's hard to judge Jock Palance's performance in this context. And a lot of the performances of Stanley Kubrick movies, especially The Shining with Nicholson going so far over the top. 2001. These extremely cold and distant performances mm -hmm. that don't even seem human. They seem more robotic than human. It's intentional. Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall going way over the top. That's intentional. And you have to take the artist as it is. This was what they wanted. These are great directors. They know what they're doing. So saying that, I think her performance is beautiful. She's so compelling to look at and watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If she was fully clothed, by the way, we'd still be saying this. But it's beyond even just being beautiful. She has it. You know, she has this incredible That's screen true. presence. I love her performance. I think that the malaise that she's experiencing, the sadness, it actually felt relatable in the way that you have to internalize heartbreak like that before you can make the decision that you need to make. And she never really says it out loud. She actually absolutely never says it out loud the thing that hurt her and that ruined her marriage. And it's not like he wouldn't know either. It's a strange thing to this not just come out and say. Yeah, this is why the screenplay is so interesting, that they never say it out loud. They're both dancing around it with their own little coping mechanisms. Mm. So maybe their marriage was going to be doomed to no, no matter what. Could They're be. this bad at communicating with each other. I also really like uh, Michelle Piccoli's performance as Paul. First film. It's the first film he this ever was made. His debut? Okay. Yeah. He's Henri in Belle de Jour, which we covered a couple years ago. Did other movies with Boonwell as well. So in the span of, what's that, about four years, he's working with two of the most beautiful women in the history of Hollywood. And he <laughs> plays their lover in both of them. Well, he's the husband here. But in both cases, they don't really want to be with him, especially Belle de Jour even more so. <laughs> so he's got these beautiful women to look at and play against. who are both quite good, especially Bardot, I think. Deneuve is more opaque, I guess deliberately, in Belle de Jour. Jack Palance, we talked about Shane already. He was nominated for that and so quiet and still 10 years before this came out. Batman, where he plays the mob boss that Nicholson kills. And he won an Oscar for City Slickers a couple years after Batman. He's got a great face. And a great voice, too. And I think he knew exactly what he had in that face and how to play with the persona that it gave him. And probably everything he did. The only other people that are even listed on the cast list, because on IMDb it's just five people, Bardot, Piccoli, Palance, Maul, and Lang. But it's Raoul Coutard, who is the cameraman in the movie itself, and then he's playing the cameraman in that opening scene where they're shooting Francesca. Jean-Luc Godard plays Lang's assistant director, and then Linda Veris is the siren. They're the only people who are even listed at all in the IMDb, those eight people. I guess we talked about all the things with Godard. He did write this in addition to directing it, and he based it on Alberto Moravia's 1954 novel called A Ghost at Noon. But apparently the book was nothing really like this movie. It was <laughs> truly just based on. And his producers were one guy you probably don't know, but maybe the other one you do. The one you may not know is Georges de Beauregard, who also worked on Breathless, and then Cleo from 5 to 7. That's a Varda film. Maybe we'll cover one of these days. But Carlo Ponti, who's a pretty big name, he worked on Dr. Zhivago a couple years later, and he was Sophia Loren's husband, and he always wanted to get her in things and did produce a lot of her movies. He wanted her for this, and she would have been a great choice too because she was staggeringly beautiful this time frame. But I guess that's not what... They wanted a bigger star. She wasn't that well. She won an Oscar not. already. She won the Oscar for two women by this point. Well, I read that they I just think... wanted Bardot for that box office cachet. Well, and also Bardot is French and Lorraine is Italian, so maybe that's part of it too. The movie's two, three, five to one. We watched it on, I don't know if it's really iTunes anymore. Things are different. People may have seen this in their own lives with how you try to get a movie now, but it was the iTunes link, I thought, and I thought the print was excellent, and the movie looks good anyway. It's a beautifully shot movie. Raoul Coutard did shoot it. She also shot Breathless, Jules and Jim for Truffaut, and well, I guess we would say Zed, but Z later in the 60s. And he shot many others for Godard. Agnes Guillemot, 
I think I'm saying that right, was Godard's regular editor. She also cut for Truffaut, so she knew them both pretty well, I guess. And Georges Delarue, as any of you might recognize, because he did an awful lot of, I think, more, actually, American movies than he ever did French ones. He did the music for Platoon and Twins and also won an Oscar for A Little Romance, which was many years before either one of those. I think he's the one that did that music in Platoon you think of. If you know Platoon, you know the music I'm thinking of. I think that was his original. I don't think it's some classical thing that he adapted. And that one is where famous. Willem Dafoe buys it, that famous scene. Is well, that's it? a recurring theme you hear in the music, the whole movie, the entire film you hear that. But he did the music for this. I guess you agree it looked great, but what do you think of the cutting and the music and so on? Yeah, it's interesting when you talk about an auteur and then you learn that they work with the same crew over and over again. There has to be a level of creativity and collaboration going on with this team. These people have to think like him and be able to work with him. So a lot of respect has to go to the crew as well to do these innovations and to work with him like this. I always love to talk about production design, but the sets in this film, particularly the beach house in Capri, which is a real house. It's called Casa Malaparte, and it's such a strange building. It's so industrial and cold, and it, it appears in the film in disrepair because apparently when the owner died, nobody wanted it because it's in this really strange place. It's hard to get to, and it's just such a bizarre little house, but it makes such an incredible almost character unto itself in the film. And another thing that makes you detached as a viewer, those stairs and that dangerous balcony, you could easily fall to your death from that yeah. roof, and they spend so much time out there. Also, the apartment, which was built for the film. They must have been, because they and go all over the place. They go all over thing. the place, yeah. And the camera's going places it shouldn't be able to go. But beyond that, it just doesn't look like a real apartment at all. It's almost like an apartment in somebody's dream. These rooms don't make sense. You go up, you go down. There's this itty-bitty little kitchen. There's the rooms. It's like they aren't even trying to resemble a real building. It has this strange layout, and the way the camera moves just serves to remind us that it's not real. It's convoluted. It's off-putting. Also, this is the apartment they keep trying to buy. They want to finish the renovations because it's also unfinished. You have all these bare walls and doors leaned up places. It's under construction and it's this large space full of small misshapen rooms. It doesn't feel comfortable. doesn't feel practical. Is it a metaphor for their marriage? Well, probably, yeah. And you agree the movie looks good as far as how it was shot too. It's beautiful. One of the things that keeps me Coming back to Godard, even if I don't love him, is that his images are beautiful and they're compelling. There's so much style to them. And that Pierrot movie what really works. There's also great use of color in that, I believe. Beautiful. I was just looking, color. by the way, I was scrolling around when you were talking a minute ago, and there's some shorts in here. He did short movies before Breathless, and there's some shorts between this and other ones he, he did. He throughout his whole career. He if did you heard shorts. me scrolling, listeners, it's because there's so much stuff. I only got to the mid to late 60s, and I was scrolling forever because there's so many shorts, but also there's Alphaville and there's Viva Sa Vie after, or before this. And Breathless is before this, of course, too. There's so many movies this guy made, even that short period of time of the early to mid-60s. Never mind the fact he worked until, I think, into the 90s or 2000s. I think Maybe his last the... credit was 2019 or something. He died wow. in 22. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What happens next? Well, Michel Piccoli ends up getting to play Catherine Deneuve's lover in Belle de Jour a few years later. So he was winning at life in the 60s, <laughs> although neither the women like him in the end. As for his character in Contempt, he continues to be a mediocre writer, just getting by... Or maybe since he's shown he's willing to sell out to a sleazy producer, he keeps doing that. What's he got to hawk this time, though? He doesn't have a wife anymore. He makes a few bucks, though, ends up with a big house, and another wife he doesn't love the way she wants to be loved. Then he dies as he lived, unhappily. This is not a happy guy at all. Hey, last thoughts on our last movie in February, Contempt. I may not have really liked the experience of watching Contempt, but it is just such a pleasure to dig into a film that was made with real bravery and intent, whether you enjoy it or not. I liked it a lot, certainly more than you, especially for Godard, because he's not my favorite. I respect his talent, but I've never loved his films. Maybe it helps if we're looking at Brigitte Bardot for an hour and 43 minutes. I think she's good, though, not just a bombshell. It's okay to admit that it's fun to look at oh, I beautiful always like people. To do. Yeah. We do that in this. I'm sure a lot of people hear this and think, it's not about their looks. Okay, but looking at a beautiful vista, beautiful clothing. I love looking at great-looking guys, too. Come on, it just adds to the enjoyment of a film. Mm -hmm. It's silly to deny it. But she did Coiled Rage very well in this, too. She knew how to do the old Rage Coiled Up. I even liked that 30-minute argument scene more than you did. I thought there was some good depth there. And by the way, love in a word month ended up being French love month too. French love. Paris is a major part of Ninochka. Sabrina, plus some of these actors and the filmmakers are French. And if we're talking how international we were in February, Mogambo is set entirely in Africa. I covered that on Friday. And Tracy is going to school in London at the end of Manhattan, which I covered earlier in the month. So which of the four movies that we covered together did you like the best? I'd say Ninochka. Ninochka. It's like not even a contest, yeah, actually. Wouldn't. I love that movie. I've but thought this, about it a lot since we've seen it. And this wasn't far behind, but that was so funny and so well done. And Bardo, Bardo, Garbo <laughs> is fantastic. 
So that was how we saw Contempt. Merci for listening. Next week marks the closest without going over. We'll get to the Oscars. So we'll be posting our ninth annual Oscars preview show. That goes up on March 4th as we gear up for the Academy Awards on March 10th. We'll also post an Oscars post-view podcast the night after the big show, unless the Oscars broadcast is so dull that there's nothing to say. No one got slapped last year, so maybe we're due for that again. But we've been doing an after-show special for about five years now, so I don't see why we'd end that streak. And it won't go up till about 10 o'clock at night because you have to work, and then we got to come home and eat, record it, and i got to edit it before it goes up. And I have to work after that. Anyway, the coming attractions opinion question for this year's Oscars is what I always ask leading into this particular show. What do you want to see win Best Picture? All right, so for our answers to that question, check out next week's Oscar preview podcast. You already know how to find us, but let me remind you to favorite or subscribe wherever you listen, which is also where you can find our archive of hundreds of episodes that are available for free. 572. 572. While you're there, leave us a rating and a review. That's a great way to support the podcast. We're both on Twitter. I'm at Bev Ellis Ellis, and Ryan is at MovieFiend51. You can also reach us by email. Have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com? And you can find our podcast on YouTube. Our channel is at H-Y-E-S Ellis. And to enjoy freshly roasted premium coffee delivered straight to you in Canada or the U.S., please go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S and enjoy a 20% discount. Sorry I'm distracted by both a dog barking, which is also getting our foster dog all riled up, but I also got wondering how appealing Bardot would be if she spent an entire movie happy and smiling, unlike in this because who isn't more appealing when they're happy and smiling? And she's already so appealing. And cut!